it's in the 21st century, the role of information specialists, um, the, the global network of information resources, curating the scholarly record and so on. I'd love to get you, your take on you know, how this sounds. Are we going in the right direction? Are the things missing? Well, I, <clears throat> excuse me. I've not read the entire plan, but just the, um, the kind of bulleted material that you just uh, highlighted here. So um, I, I guess the first thing I should say is that I'm really um, delighted to see an institutional strategic plan that puts this much focus on this collection of activities and the library's role in it. And, um, I, I think calling out these activities as well as the library's role is very important. Um, uh, it seems to me that um, the practice of scholarship and the way it's transmitted and documented um, are changing pretty radically. And um, I think many institutions have been slow to realize how extensive the implications of those changes are going to be. Um, and that includes coming up with institutional strategies. And genuinely, they are institutional strategies, um, not library strategies uh, for things like research data management. I mean, the library is a instrument of the institution strategy, but it's something that really needs to be absorbed at a, at a high level in the institutions um, you know, budgeting and setting of priorities and everything else. Uh, so I was very, um, I was very happy to see these kinds of things coming center stage. Um, the other thing that struck me as um, really um, significant was the explicit recognition in, I forget which, probably the third bullet there, that um, Carnegie Mellon's library would be part of a network of peer research libraries that would collectively manage um, a, a record of information and make it accessible. And I think that's a very, very significant thing to see. Again, recognized not at the level of the library director. Library directors and um, their teams have, you know, for years been working um, with networks of peers collectively, but to see at the institutional leadership level recognize that um, we are not in a situation where any single library can successfully stand and function and do what it needs alone um, is really important. So I, I think that um, the, those kinds of observations um, uh, called out in this um, strategic plan really bode well for the future of the library and for getting support um, for what what needs to be done in the next uh, decades. Um, you know, one of the strikingly difficult arguments to make as a library, let's say, in an institution it, in a setting, is. Um, you do things as a research library that benefit the scholarly community as a whole, including your institution, but the benefits don't always accrue directly to your institution. There's a sort of a circle of gifts phenomenon here where everybody is stronger by contributing to the circle of gifts. Um, but that's been a very hard sell sometimes to administrations who want to, you know, be, want to insist every penny is going to our direct benefit. Um, and um, it's nice not to see that kind of thinking here because uh, in the long run, I think it will serve you better to think more strategically there. That last point is an interesting one in the context of open access. And we see a lot of debate in the community about moving towards a gold open access model where the author or the funder or the institution pays to publish rather than paying mm -hmm. to purchase access. And I wonder there about the shift in the burden of cost, because if we take a, a hypothetical journal mm -hmm. bundle where the costs are distributed fairly evenly across thousands of universities mm -hmm. around the world, and flip that to 
an author pays model, we'll see the burden of cost be borne disproportionately by research intensive universities. I've been working with a society in the US where Carnegie Mellon is the biggest contributing institution. If we run the numbers from a subscription model, we pay about 20,000 a year. If we were to go to an author payment model, Carnegie Mellon's cost would be about 300,000. So yes, it's nice to have that, that notion of the public good and so on, but do we risk really undoing a system that whilst far from perfect, at least levels the costs, or should we go for transformation? Well, I, I think that's a very interesting issue, specifically in the context of open access. Um, I mean, the, the kinds of things I were driving at before um, uh, really go much broadly, much more broadly than traditional open access, and deal with the, you know, sort of collective stewardship of material that is of scholarly importance but not heavily used, and that kind of thing. Um, the open access uh, situation, and particularly the shift over to um, uh, author-funded author gold access, um, is really scary. Uh, and I've seen some of the kinds of numbers you're referring to, where um, universities um, look at uh, the scenario of, well, we are a major producer of research here, and a major um, a source of articles for the scholarly literature. So as we go to author pays, it, it places a disproportionate burden on us. Um, uh, the University of California, for example, um, uh, has done some projections there that are kind of disturbing. Um, I've also um, had some conversations with the folks in the UK who are you know, sliding around uh, to this. So I, I think there are a number of, of responses. Um, uh, one is that I'm not sure that author pays is really a great model for open access. I think that um, going more directly to the funding of journals, perhaps by um, funders, perhaps by um, uh, coalitions of um, of universities may be a better strategy and a fairer strategy. Um, it also gets a lot of the transactional stuff out of the mix, which I'm always eager to avoid. Um, uh, it would help to um, deal with uh, some of the problems with so-called predatory journals and take a bit of the burden off of uh, faculty authors who are trying to um, sort through whether new journal starts are legitimate. Now, I, I can also see a whole series of downside problems and dangers in that model about um, uh, potentially restricting or um, constraining the start of new journals, which is a mixed blessing, um, and other things. Um, but I think we really need to talk about those sorts of things analytically. And, you know, again, when you come back to this working within a peer network, um, that's, the, that's the group of people that need to sort these. Um, just having the publishers pop up and say, you can ransom your articles, um, uh, isn't necessarily the right thing. There's a, there are a number of very well-established open to access um, venues that don't take author fees. And those are wonderful. Um, uh, you sort of wonder how they limp along on grants and um, uh, the personal commitment of the scholars who run them and things like that. But um, there are existence proofs that those can, can operate. Um, I, I also think um, that getting to a purely author side uh, funded model is um, maybe going to be harder than you think. These hybrid journals um, and the rate at which they flip um, uh, from subscription funded to author funded or fee funded um, is very problematic. And, and right now, um, 
there's at least some evidence that um, uh, there are folks doing very well um, working both sides of the equation. Uh, yeah, I, th I think there are a number of interesting threads there. Just as a data point from the UK, they are spending about £40 million pounds a year on author yep. fees and the rough calculation of the administrative costs across the system are about £7 million mm -hmm. pounds when you add up institutional administrators and so on. So it's not a cheap system. When the government brought it in, they said, we'll fund this for five years, mm -hmm. which will give libraries time to transition and cut back on their subscriptions because authors will be paying. What they had neglected was that the UK represents about 7% of the global scholarly output, mm -hmm. and UK researchers still wanted to read the other 93%. Mm -hmm. yeah. Therefore, library subscriptions were never going to be reduced, mm -hmm. which makes me believe that the solution, if there is to be a solution, is to be found in some concerted global action, because no country that's Even right. not in the US has the dominant publishing power that can overcome that national system. Yeah. How do we get the world's research funders together, or is it to say that the e-life model needs to be pursued more aggressively? Well, I, I mean, I think that it's a remarkable um, oversight that some of these uh, national initiatives towards open access did not realize um, very explicitly and very early that in the majority of cases, um, uh, scholarly publishing is an international enterprise and um, is not fully dominated by any single nation. Um, you probably could put together a coalition of not a huge number of nations that would be adequate to um, you know, turn the tide, but it would take genuine coordination um, between uh, between the countries. Now, I know that inside Europe there are some discussions at the uh, European Union level about you know harmonizing or coordinating open access policies. The you know the the UK um, through the JISC is in there. The um, folks in the Netherlands are in there. Um, the Max Planck Institute is active in there, sure. representing um, uh, the German uh, interest. But um, CNI, for example, pulls together a, a small meeting every other summer um, with some of the UK academic le uh, leadership um, through our partnership with the JISC. And um, this was very much on the agenda when we met in the summer of uh, 2014. But the problem that the folks over there have is um, they can kind of bring three people to the table and say, well, you know, we can't exactly speak for the UK, but we sort of can. Um, and you say, well, who comes to the table from the US? OSTP, the um, you know, we, we've seen how um, uh, varied the agency interpretations of the OSTP directive are here for public access, which hasn't been the most helpful thing in the world. Um, uh, the private foundations, there are too many of them, they're too diffuse. Um, so there's a great problem because I can't envision any um, international coalition that would have enough weight in the scholarly publishing arena without the U.S. there. Um, you know, they are clearly a large player. Um, but it's not obvious who should speak for the U.S. And there, there's also the, the financial aspect, which we can't ignore completely. And I know that our president, when he was head of the NSF, mm -hmm. was asked by the research councils from the U.K. Mm -hmm. to form a, a global alliance. Mm -hmm but the cost to the U.S. science system for the NSF alone mm -hmm. was going to be about $700 million. Mm -hmm. And I just can't see the scientific community giving up that amount Agreed. of research grant. Mm -hmm. And I haven't heard anything in any of the presidential mm -hmm. debates where mm -hmm. they're saying, let's forget about building walls and so on and put money into the scientific enterprise. One could only hope. <laughs> um, yeah. 
maybe we'll try yeah, to get maybe. into publishing. You, you never know. Yeah. And the other the other piece of this that I think gets a little bit too much of a pass is um, the actual magnitude of the author costs. Yeah. Um, it's it's not obvious to me why some of these should be as expensive as they are. Which is a segue into the, the other player in all of this, which often gets ignored, which is the professional or learned societies. Mm -hmm. And in my time with Wiley, I really was astonished by the power that the societies have to drive the costs of journal subscriptions because they are in a very lucrative market. Publishers want to publish mm -hmm. titles on behalf of the best societies. The societies see this as a cash cow, and it becomes a, a cycle of mm -hmm. income from publishers to societies mm -hmm. driven by author fees. I recognize that societies do a lot of good with the money they receive, funding early career researchers mm -hmm. and sure. so on. Do they have a stake in the system that needs to be addressed somehow? Well, you know, we do see a lot of cross-subsidy. Um, uh, some of it really strange. Um, where you started out with a society that, if you looked at its finances in 1940, basically was taking on um, most of its revenue from member dues and a little revenue from conference that typically maybe made a little bit better than break even. Um, and a little bit from library subscriptions, which back then were about the same as um, individual subscriptions. And um, now you see uh, these tremendously distorted revenue streams where libraries are a huge part of it because the library, you know, um, subscription rates are an order of magnitude more than the individual subscription rates. You, and, and that's triggered a vicious cycle where memberships eroding at a lot of these uh, individual memberships because they say, well, the only thing I get from the society anyway, besides a bill, is uh, the journal. And now I can get that through my institution. Um, and, and then you see the societies, as you say, doing unquestionably good kinds of things, um, subsidizing um, uh, um, early career people, high school students to move into to, or get exposed to the disciplines, advocacy of various kinds. All good, but I'm not sure it should be coming out of library budgets which is de facto what's happening now. Um, there's a certain um, entitlement mentality um, at some of these societies that sort of says, well, you know, we can just keep raising our rates and don't need to recalibrate what we're doing. Um, I mean, I remember, you know, just to, to name and shame, um, the uh, AAAS, which publishes science. Um, I did a stint some years ago as um, uh, um, elect, uh, the um, president, elect president, past president of um, Section T, which is com computing and information science. And that, uh, that um, permits you to go to a um, several hour presentation on um, uh, Sunday morning where basically um, the society leadership talks about, um, you know, how the society is doing the strategy. It's not, there, there's a board which is separate and, you know, does really strategic things, but this is a kind of a reporting out to the, to the membership in an intermediated way. And they had um, these wonderful um, charts up about, um, the subscriptions to science and the revenue stream. And science is very unusual because um, uh, they actually make a meaningful revenue stream off of uh, advertising as well. Except that it turns out that advertising is much less valuable online, at least for that marketplace. So as more and more of their viewing moved online and their paper subscriptions dried up, um, their advertising was um, uh, concomitantly diminishing. 
So they said, oh, well, no problem. Uh, we know exactly what to do. We expect the, um, you know, re the net revenue from science to stay constant or go up a few percent a year. And we're just going to raise the subscription rates on the universities till it does. Simple. Um, and I, I think you see a lot of that kind of, you know, financial strategy. They feel they've got a thing people can't live without. And, um, uh, they're just going to do that until the system really comes unglued, which it will. And I think science and nature have, at least in some parts of the world, the benefit of being a distinctive component of the Shanghai Chow Tong mm -hmm. University rankings. Mm -hmm. The more you publish in those two journals, mm -hmm. the greater your position mm -hmm. in the ranking system. And I remember when I was in Australia, nature putting up the subscription 23% mm -hmm. from one year to the next. Yeah. And we thought about having a, a bit of a, a campaign on campus against this, threatening to cancel. And we were very firmly told that nature and science were sacrosanct because mm -hmm. they were such critical components mm -hmm. of our mm -hmm. institutional reputation. Mm -hmm. So, it's and, and I, I mean, there are, there are questions that I've not seen asked much, too. Um, both of those are these sort of sacrosanct things that are just viewed as so high impact that um, they've got to be accommodated and, you know, in fact, careers ride on getting a nature paper or a science paper accepted. Um, it's very odd at the same time that these are about the, these are among the very rather few journals I can think of that come with a whole news apparatus around them to ensure that they continue to be high impact and um, you know maybe maybe there's a lesson there for other journals maybe there's something there we ought to think about in um, redesigning the system as I, either it should be more common or less common and I'm not sure which. Uh, but it is an odd, you know, sort of, they're, they're both oddly dual function. Yeah. So another, another couple of strands here that I'd like us to talk about. One is the converse to the, the author pays model and, mm -hmm. and have a bit of a conversation about repositories. And secondly, something about arts and the humanities, because we're very much focused on mm -hmm. the scientific article which on a campus like this has its place, but on a campus mm -hmm. like this we also have mm -hmm. tremendous interest in the arts and humanities. Mm -hmm. Which would you like to go with first? Um, oh, why don't, why don't we finish, uh, why, don't, why don't we start with repositories yeah. and go around from there? So I, I guess there are a number of interesting aspects there. You've been writing and talking about repositories for at least a decade. Mm -hmm. So thinking back to the early 2000s when momentum was picking up, mm -hmm. do you get a sense that we're moving in the direction that was intended or have publishers been able to impede progress? Have institutional mandates helped or hindered? So, so um, let me say a few things about this and let me also point at this very nice book that uh, has just come out. Um, and. Um, uh, it's, it's a good kind of compendium of, of what's happening right now, and um, uh, Daniel has, can tell you much more about it, um, so uh, we'll leave that for, um, for later. But um, I think it's, I, I, there, there are a couple things I want to say here. So I wrote this article um, back around 2002 or three. Um, about repositories, which I guess was kind of in the right place at the right time, along with a couple of other articles. So people people connect back to it, but it's really interesting because, to me, because there really are two quite distinct visions of what institutional repositories are about that go back to that period and. Um, they get, you know, kind of elided and um, cross-referenced in very interesting ways. So there was, there's one view that basically says primarily institutional repositories are in the service of open access. And the reason you have them is 
to allow your faculty to make their publications available to the public. And from this comes um, all of the kind of ideas that you hear from people like Stephen Harnad about author self-archiving. Um, and there's some very nice things about that model. One of the really nice things about the model, that, that view of the world, is that um, you, can, you can measure success and you can measure impact fairly easily. You can measure your success rate by doing estimates, which are reasonably straightforward to do, about um, how many articles the faculty and students at a given institution are publishing per year. And then you can look at what proportion of them are represented in the repository. And you can do various things, funder mandates, faculty policy mandates, et cetera, to up those numbers over time. Um, out, just regular old outreach. You can measure impact by looking at how often those articles are getting downloaded by doing various kinds of bibliometrics on them. Um, this, is, this is a pretty tidy world, actually. Um, it is, uh, the, the final thing I'll say about that view of the world is that um, at least in the States, the publishers have not been, I'm sorry, the um, Funding agencies have not been very good about this. We spent a decade talking up the idea of open access to faculty, which, and I think it's it's the right idea. You know, the the fundamental notion that um, uh, the products of research should be open to the public and to other researchers, and that's how you um, how you move scholarship along and. Um, move society along. But the kind of mechanisms that we mostly recommended to faculty, publishing in open access journals, putting things in institutional repositories, actually don't meet the funder requirements right now. So we're in this insane position where we have to go to our faculty and say, well, We've been telling you about open access, and you got on board, and we've all been doing the right things, and now your funders are on, on board too, except that they have a whole different list of things that you need to do in order to satisfy the funder requirements for public access. And personally, that feels horribly awkward to me, and I think it's going to be um, a source of great confusion and problems over the next five years. And um, I'm, I'm very disappointed that we haven't been able to um, put more pressure on um, uh, OSTP and the funding agencies to rationalize this better. Um, there are some technical solutions as we get better at doing cross-repository uh, propagation and things like that. Um, one can envision the notion that if the faculty just put it in the institutional repository, we can build and connect systems that do the right things on their behalf. But that actually is a non-trivial um, uh, collection of inter-system linkages, um, and it's not particularly facilitated by the fact that inter-system linkages work best when all the systems want to interoperate. Um, so anyway, that's one view of repositories, which puts them as essentially infrastructure for the open access movement. There's another view of repositories, and it's the one that I espoused in the early 2000s, and honestly still espouse, which is that, which is that in a world where scholarship is becoming more digital and the artifacts of this don't, aren't going to fit neatly into templates like journal articles, um, and where universities, which have, great universities have always been intellectual centers. If you think of the number of 
events, performances, symposia, lectures that go on at a place like this every day. Um, uh, this is very significant. It's typically not well represented in the traditional scholarly publishing streams, and it's getting easier and easier to document, um, to persist through various forms of recording um, and capture. Um, all of this kind of material, all the institutional material, all of the work of individual scholars that shouldn't and can't necessarily be constrained to the simple templates of printed monographs and traditional journal articles needs to be cared for. It needs a place where we can put it and take care of it and share it. And that was my view of institutional repositories, was as platforms for um, ex uh, experts at the institution to work together with faculty to take care of this material, organize it, preserve it, and make it public. And sure, as a you know incidental matter, that should include all the articles and monographs, and indeed maybe rough drafts and the stuff that wound up getting cut out of the monographs because they needed to keep it to 500 pages. And really, there's more scholarship under there that is valuable and should be available to the people who want it. Um, all kinds of things like that, to my view, belong in the repository. And uh, I continue to believe that they're important, most of all, in that role. If you just want to do preprints or e-prints or whatever you want to call them, it's probably easier and cheaper to do that on a um, disciplinary basis. Um, I doubt that most universities can um, drive down costs as low as things like the archive that, that Paul Ginsberg runs at Cornell or, um, well, I was going to say uh, PubMed, but that's expensive, but there are also reasons why that's expensive. Um, uh, but I, I, it, it just seems like um, uh, if you just want to aggregate e-prints, um, uh, there, there probably are more efficient ways to do it. Um, uh, so while that's a good thing to do with a repository, it's not why I build one. Now, I, I just, I've gone on a long time about this, but it's a, a sort of story that needs telling. Um, uh, and I'll just note two things, um, two more points. So unlike the open access vision of repositories, one of the troubles with the proposal that, um, that I'm arguing for is that it's hard to tell how well you're doing or how much impact you have. Um, how much material is in there relative to how much should be in there or how much is out there that you might collect? Those are very speculative numbers when you move away from these kind of transactional publications that we have been understanding and documenting. And what's the impact of this material? Um, very hard to know in some cases. Um, uh, it's, it's very anecdotal. Um, uh, computing things that I have to say I consider a little dubious anyway, like um, impact factors and things um, uh, gets, uh, we don't know how to do that at this point. Um, we really mostly know raw numbers about downloads and, and anecdotes about impact. Some of the raw numbers about downloads are really weird too, by the way. Um, I have seen, for example, um, numbers out of places like Virginia Tech when they started putting master's theses online that are astounding. I mean, nobody reads master's theses. Certainly, nobody downloads it 30,000 times in a month. Um, so, so there are things going on here that we just absolutely don't understand, and they may be as banal as um, you know, robots that need a little programming help, or there may be something deeper going on. But <coughs> Really understanding the impact of institutional repositories um, in the in the broad sense that I'm I'm describing them this is a generational program. 
I mean, we're 10 years in in running these things at this point. Um, it's probably time to do some surveys. Probably in another 10 years, it's time to start looking more seriously at what's in there. And in particular, what's been preserved because those were there that would likely not have been preserved otherwise. We actually need to go long enough down this path to see um, a significant number, for example, of faculty retirements and see whether some of this scholarship can transcend the active professional life of the faculty that created it because of this infrastructure. So that's that. those are some of the things I think about there. And, um, you know, I, one of the, one of the um, great mysteries to me is um, how little effort is put into dealing with um, faculty towards the end of their scholarly careers. Um, yes, you know, their papers get hauled off to the archives and things like that, but many of them have amassed tremendous amounts of unpublished material, of underlying data, of things like that, and um, trying to figure out ways to organize that and um, uh, make sure it's not just totally lost um, seems to me to be a very fruitful and relatively inexpensive activity. Um, and one of, one, not the, but one of a set of um, strategies that should be put in place around repositories. I think, as you signaled in the early days, people thought of repositories as containers or buckets of journal articles. And now we see that soloist being surrounded by an orchestra of other products of research data, mm -hmm. executable content, images, videos of performances, music scores, and so on. And all of this becomes increasingly complex, but also increasingly expensive mm -hmm. to curate. And I wonder what your thoughts are about that, that cost versus possibility of reuse. And do we, is it better to err on the side of bearing the cost up front just in case, or trying to be more selective in what we curate so that we're not sucking up money just because we can. So, so I think that is one of the central challenges right now um, that libraries and archives and research data managers, um, for example, are facing. Um, there are different nuances of it depending on whether you situate it in the context of, say, research data management or something else. But um, this is a really hard problem that uh, I would like to see really addressed much more head on. So. There is one view that says that if you haven't done a thoroughly exquisite documentation and attachment of comprehensive metadata, you might not have bothered, might as well not have bothered in the first place. Um, I would speculate that we have a very poor understanding of the um, interactions between the existence of certain kinds of metadata and reuse in various sorts of scenarios, and that there is an awful lot of mythology there that isn't borne out. Um, there's, um, uh, you know, there are bits of evidence that surface that are quite, um, quite disturbing, and I can come back to a couple of those in a minute, but um, when we talk about sort of midterm um, uh, preservation and stewardship, let's say, you know, think in terms of keeping something alive for 40 or 50 years, not 200, but 30, 40, something like that, a bit beyond the um, the, the, the time when the creator of the material is likely to be around to help with lapses in documentation. Um, typically, somewhere between half and um, a good deal more than half of the costs of that preservation activity are the initial ingest and documentation and attachment of metadata and things like that. 
So that means you are really spending a lot of money on the hope that it might be reused. Um, it would be much better, I think, particularly given the dubious connection between documentation and reuse, um, to be able to save more and um, the way to do that is to reduce that kind of initial you know, barrier to in, to intake. So I I think um, being smart about that in various ways, and some of that is not collecting metadata that's expensive to collect and that you're not sure you need. Um, automatically picking up as much metadata as you can, and um, you know I think that we can do much better in the design of scientific experiments and our use of notebooks and um, uh, smart instrumentation and things like that um, uh, to pick up a lot of things just as byproducts of doing the work rather than coming back later as, a, as an explicit extra and sort of redundant step. Um, I, I think there are very fruitful things to do there. Um, it, Right now, you know, we, we have this tremendous problem when we think about data reuse, about the discovery side of it. Um, we don't really know how much of the data that gets reused is discovered, you know, sort of totally from scratch at, um, by somebody rummaging around in a database as opposed to someone who says, I want to build on these two studies and I'm going to contact the two authors and get their data and maybe even bring them in as collaborators if they're interested and build on from there. Or, you know, this is a this is a sort of a benchmark data set that's well known in the literature. Or even I know that Professor Jones back in the nineteen nineties studied this stuff extensively and I never knew Professor Jones and he's been dead ten years, but um, if I start looking under Professor Jones in the archive, I can start figuring out what's in there and whether it's relevant, which is a very different discovery mechanism than, um, you know, specifying the attributes of the data you want. We don't know what goes on there. We do know that it is exceedingly difficult to build systems that do precision um, discovery among very heterogeneous things. So, you know, if you are interested in um, fossilized dinosaur fingernails that are, are at least three inches long, um, and you're looking in a database that mixes up paintings and weather observations from, you know, the British Navy in the 1870s and things like that, you probably can't formulate that query very well and you probably won't get a very good answer back. Um, these kinds of, um, you know, uh, enormous um, data repositories, um, I, I think we've hyped the, the we, we've hyped the sophistication of the discovery capabilities we can create quite a bit. So I, I'd be careful there. I also think that um, we need to we need to accept the progress and the vector of progress about content-based retrieval for large classes of material. So, for example, one of the ways you can spend a lot of money is attaching subject headings to uh, records describing things or subject description. Done very well, for example, by the kind of folks who write abstracts for high impact stuff like medical journals, um, this can be quite useful, but it's expensive. Now, Doing this dates from a day when it was hard to get the underlying material and so you wanted a surrogate for it. If you've got the whole underlying text to compute on, I would argue that there is a very significant class of material where the investment in this kind of secondary description probably doesn't make sense economically. Um, but. Uh, we've been very slow to let that go. 
um, and, and it's been very painful. Every year, <coughs> our ability to compute on text corpora gets better. <coughs> what we can do <coughs> searching on Google now, you know, was unthinkable 20 years ago um, when those texts were starting to appear. We're getting really good at this, and we're starting to be able to do other hard things like voice recognition and um, voice to text uh, kinds of discovery mechanisms, image recognition, facial recognition. Some of the things that you know we're we're able to do are untidy, but there's still things can, that can be brought into the service of discovery and. As long as they're computationally driven, they're probably cheap and going to get cheaper. Um, so uh, I, I think that you know postponing that kind of human intellectual analysis till you're sure it's justified is probably a good strategy. That maybe is a nice branch into a topic that C and I had an executive round table on last year, which was digital humanities, mm -hmm. and. Be interested to hear your thoughts on how libraries, in particular, can support digital humanities both in a sustainable way and at, at the scale that the technology is enabling. Okay. Um, so I guess the first thing I, I, I should just say is how much I hate the term digital humanities because it's so. It's so misleading, it makes it sound like it's not humanities or it's something different. And, um, you know, what What I think of is basically it's this is humanistic inquiry that is conducted at least in part using digital tools of one sort and another and sometimes has some of its um, outcomes communicated using uh, various kinds of digital mechanism, digital media and mechanisms. Um, when you cast it like that, um, uh, even some of the most um, hardcore anti-digital humanities people have in fact been practicing digital humanities for a long time, you know. Um, some of them use word processors. Um, some of them search online catalogs for books or even use Google when they think nobody's looking. Um, uh, it's, it's very funny how, the, how this works, but I think when you cast it that way, what we really want to do about digital humanities at scale um, is to make it possible for as many of the humanists at our institutions who want to, to be able to employ digital tools and resources that are beneficial in their work and um, as part of their working methods. That, that's really what you're after. And um, that's been hard to do. Um, we've had terrible problems from the IT side partially because these tools are not well polished in many cases. Um, uh, um, they're specialized. Um, and um, you see this problem in the sciences too. Um, but uh, they seem to get enough money in most of their grants to be able to hire people who make recalcitrant software behave, you know. So you look at the physicists putting up something like Globus. Um, I mean, this is not a really, um, you wouldn't want to put this on the consumer market um, and have your grandmother try and set it up on her machine. Um, the, the humanists have had less success attracting grants that can attract that level of hand-holding. Many of them are relying on institutional support, and we've had a lot of trouble getting the right mix of institutional um, support and tools that we can afford to support into those humanities venues. I think actually we've had more success than we give ourselves credit for in some cases ranging from word processors to various kinds of databases. 
I mean, JSTOR is an amazing success um, in that setting. Uh, heavily, heavily used and adopted and um, really not questioned at all. I think that the biggest issue in some ways for digital humanities is on the output or result side, and this is the one where the libraries can make all the difference. Um, if you look at the achievements of pioneers in digital humanities over, let's say, the last two decades, they have produced an astounding array of outputs of various kinds, um, uh, most of which are technically very, very hard to sustain or preserve. And um, the, digit the, the people who work in this area are starting to realize that, um, gosh, I've got a real dilemma here. Do I want to spend my professional life um, making discoveries and seeking understanding and to communicate understanding with the results of that work kind of quietly evaporating in a few years? Whereas my colleagues who are still writing traditional print monographs, even if we pass them around as PDFs, um, can be quite confident that their work will persist for 200 years, just like the people 200 years ago who wrote monographs. Um, and, you know, yes, the, the digital environment has its amenities and its power and um, its attractions, but that, that ability to have confidence that your work will stay around is really problematic, I think. Um, libraries collectively um, need to step up to this for a lot of reasons. Most of the scholarly publishing world and the humanities isn't going to do it um, or isn't going to do it without a huge push and engagement from libraries as partners, I think. Yeah. I think we're seeing in the scientific field increasingly compound artifacts of, of publications, mm -hmm. the, the raw article mm -hmm. with data embedded. I'm not seeing that trend happening in the humanities. Mm -hmm. And that's where I see almost that separation between the library and the librarian, with mm -hmm. the librarian bringing that information expertise into the research process. Mm -hmm. Not because the researcher couldn't do it, but we can hopefully do it more efficiently, more effectively, and add that layer of integrity to the scholarly record that, as you say, might otherwise yeah. be bypassed. I, I think the other thing that, that that's really important here is about and this will sound strange, constraining choices in many cases. Because so much of the sciences um, comes out in journal articles, um, as they start building these compound things, they still want to often deal with them in the context of journals. And so the journals and the editorial practices of the journals, even if there are things like, well, you got to put your gene sequences in GenBank, you got to get an accession number, the accession number goes in the article, and that's how we do it. But those editorial practices constrain and make uniform behavior around scientific communication. One of the really interesting experiences I had um, some years ago, was with a Mellon project called Gutenberg E. I don't know if any of you are familiar with this, but uh, the, the sort of one minute story is that they picked um, recent PhDs, assistant professors, folks like that, who were basically starting to take their PhD dissertations and move it to the first humanities monograph, as is the kind of traditional pattern. And they tried to cluster these topically. They ran this for about four years um, in neglected areas in some cases. I think they, they did some military history and diplomatic history one year. And um, uh, anyway, so they probably gave out about 
20, 25 of these grants. Um, and um, this included a guaranteed publication, uh, digital publication stream with the university press. I think it was Columbia that did most of them, but one or two were placed elsewhere. Um, and they got a bunch of money to help with this, with technical support for it. So this was actually, you know, quite a feather in um, the cap of these assistant professors to get recognized by Mellon on a, you know, sort of first monograph. And the deal here was that they had to produce an electronic version of the monograph. Um, uh, they could also do a print one, but they had to lead with an electronic one. So I. I uh, I was uh, able to sit in on the discussions where they brought these awardees together every six months or so to talk about the problems they were encountering and how they were doing and show, you know, show some of their work to each other as they went along. And this was a disaster in a certain way because basically you took a bunch of humanists who were interested in the research they're doing and said, Hi, you know, here's here's twenty thousand or fifty thousand dollars. Now, what we really want you to do is totally reconceptualize the nature of the scholarly monograph as it specializes to your work um, in the digital world. You have a blank slate. Isn't that wonderful? And for most of them, this wasn't wonderful at all. They really didn't want to spend a career thinking about. Um, what does it mean to, um, you know, totally reconceptualize the monograph in the digital world? They had some specific sort of digital affordances that they wanted to be able to exploit in, um, in documenting their research. And in a lot of cases, it was relatively mundane. It was making better connections and navigation between underlying source material that came out of archives or you know, old manuscripts or something in the exposition and analysis. Um, in a few cases, it was really interesting. I mean, I remember one guy who was doing um, a very detailed unit history um, on the Eastern Front um, in um, World War II. And he was, you know, tracking the movements of small groups of um, uh, of military formations day by day as they interacted and um, advanced and retreated. And uh, the treatment he could do of that through maps, animated maps, was really quite um, astounding and, um, uh, at least to my naive eye, hugely enriched the accessibility of the, um, uh, of the exposition. Uh, but most of them really, what they wanted was, was templated kind of things uh, so that they could use this. They didn't want, you know, a total clean slate. Um, and the, you know, the sort of ultimate final insult here was when they got done, the people at um, the press and the library sort of looked at this and went, this is a freak show of things. We've now got you know, 25 totally idiosyncratic works that are going to cost an incomprehensible amount of pain to uh, preserve for 20 or 30 years um, because each one is its own little odd universe. And that's, that's what we've got to get digital humanities past. I mean, there are a few mo people who want to explore that frontier quite explicitly and we should let them do that understanding that's risky ground and, you know, just like the people exploring digital art, there are some things that may not survive um, uh, for all that long and that's the price you pay. But for the, you know, vast um, uh, majority of humanity scholars, um, we've got to give them a, a, a straightforward pathway to communicate and have their works preserved, I think. So. We've talked quite a bit. I think it's time for the audience to get some revenge. Good idea. David has got a microphone. Whilst you're looking for a, the first question, David, you might want to do a quick plug for your book. Yes, please. Oh, sure. I um, <laughs> wasn't planning on doing that. But if, 
I only brought a copy so I can get a picture with Cliff at the end, not to do this at all by any means. Uh, but the, the book that um, Cliff was talking about, he wrote the introduction to our Making Institutional Repositories Work. Uh, it's a book I co-edited with my colleagues at Clemson University and the College of Charleston. Uh, it's a part of the Charleston Conference Series. It's available online through the Purdue University Press. Uh, and it will be made open access fully uh, within the first year of publication. So soon to be coming out uh, purely open access, hence the orange cover. So please raise your hand if you have any questions. I'll be walking around with the microphone, and we will be capturing the questions and the comments for the recording. Uh, so please just feel free to raise your hand. Yeah. Um, I guess, Cliff, uh, I'm not a librarian, so I don't know what all the librarians know. But at some point in... Uh, I forgot exactly where you were in saying this, but you said something about uh, capturing, as an alternative model, capturing all the publications from a university by all the grad students and researchers and PhDs and all those. How does that happen? How do you, how can you search and know what's being produced at Carnegie Mellon, at Columbia, at wherever? How does that happen? So, so let, let's differentiate um, back to the two views. So one view is capturing faculty publication as it's taking place through the, you know, kind of well-established venues of um, journals and um, uh, monographs and conference proceedings and representing that in the repository. Now, it turns out that you've got a couple of windows into that. Um, some of the major bibliographic databases, like um, what used to be Current Contents and it's now called Web of Science, carry institutional affiliations. So you can, in fact, do searches on there that will try and turn up material by authors with specific institutional affiliations. And in fact, some institutions actually contract with some of these services to get extracts every year that represent an attempt to capture their, um, uh, a, a look at their faculty's publication, collective publication output. Now, there are obviously limits to this. Um, so this works best in, um, fairly well-recognized scholarly journals. Um, uh, you, of course, have faculty who are writing important things in trade journals, in uh, op-eds to the New York Times, uh, you name it, and you'll miss most of that stuff. But you will get a, you know, a reasonable cut at the, at the scholarly output. Um, monographs are much harder because um, I don't really know of a central resource. There are some um, um, disciplinary oriented resources where you might be able to get some information. Um, but I don't know of a centralized resource that's really accessible by institutional affiliation. Um, um, the, um, the, the typical bibliographic kinds of things don't carry that catalogs and the records that feed those. Um, I also should just note here as a, a side issue that um, saying you want to retrieve by institutional affiliation is a much messier process than you might think. Um, the right way to do this would be to have institutional identifiers and to connect those to um, the published works and to search by institutional identifier. In fact, um, while there is some slow progress happening to do that, um, this is text search right now. So you, you end up having to look for CMU, Carnegie Mellon, all kinds of hyphenated variations. Um, it's, it's a lot like the problems you have with author personal names um, and people who can't decide if they're Cliff or Clifford from, you know, week to week. Um, uh, but 
the amount of variation people can produce for a um, institution can be genuinely impressive. Um, there's also problems of time bindings on the affiliations and, and that sort of thing. Um, but be that as it may, that's a, you can kind of get a sense of from there. Now, the other side of this is that most institutions have some kind of um, faculty reporting system. So um, uh, it's very common as part of both the tenure, the explicit tenure and promotion system, but also the um, the sort of annual reporting on what you've been doing within your department or school uh, to collect lists of publications. And um, there are many institutions now that are trying to do that in more structured ways and roll them up into various kinds of aggregations for analysis. So. Those would be ways you can kind of see how you're doing um, uh, in terms of um, matching those against what's in your repository. Hi. Uh, thanks for coming to speak with us. Uh, I'm out of Van Gulag. I'm a second year clear fellow here. Oh, cool. Um, <laughs> so, seen you speak before. Um, one of the things that I think is part of the strategic plan for the libraries is to have the liaison librarians become more of embedded research data specialists, right? So to really be involved in that research data workflow at every stage, from writing grants to saving operational data to data archiving and publishing, whatever, right? So the whole thing. But I guess my question to you is where where do you see within that research data life cycle the places where the library and, and those of us who work here can really add the most value to what researchers are doing? So I, I at, at one level, I really buy that notion of, you know, embedding with the research teams. Um, I worry about the economic scalability of it. Um, uh, there are many researchers and few librarians, relatively speaking, and that embedding can be a very time-consuming process. Um, my sort of gut instinct on this, and I would love to see some efforts to um, produce some genuine data about this, is that there's a very high payoff for getting involved early. Um, thinking about things like how to collect description as part of the work process so that you don't have to be embedded in the work process, but so that they just design the work process to do the right thing in the first place um, would be much better. It would be much better because you don't need any human in the loop. Um, there are other situations where for big projects, they are going to have IT people in the loop, and if you can give them the right guidance, they can probably take care of a lot of the curation stuff too, um, uh, as as part of the you know sort of basic data management. But um, it's important to get in there um, as the work it, workflows are being designed and the data management plans are being written. To, um, to get them to do the right thing. So I, I would say front-loading um, uh, these kinds of conversations is really, really helpful. And, um, you know, I would hope we get to the point where um, uh, faculty say things like, um, you know, I was able to produce a much more credible proposal, including the accompanying um, uh, materials like the data management and data sharing plans because I had an expert in research data management from the library who worked with me on that. And, um, uh, you know, now, now that I've got the proposal funded, um, you know, we're, we're just doing the right things that we said we would that were credible and got us the funding in the first place. That would, that would be really the happiest outcome, I think, in many cases. And that's why also I've been very um, supportive of strategies to 
inject the research data management folks into the proposal writing and, and cycling phases through things like um, the routing of, of proposals through your, uh, whatever you call it, your sponsored projects or grants office. Um, those kinds of things, those are just more ways to get you involved early. Hi, I'm Matt Marsteller here from Carnegie Mellon, and uh, in your discussions on gold open access, uh, I was uh, dying of curiosity about any specific comments you might have on scope three, uh, noting that, uh, well, I'm on the governing council for it. Um, you probably know more about it than I do. Scope three is a, you know, in my view, wonderful kind of attempt for a community to come in and um, take its uh, scholarly communication system from a place where it doesn't want it, want it to be to a place where it does want it to be. Um, I think that they have faced some very difficult negotiations and um, uh, I I wonder, I don't know whether they've, you know, given up too much to get everybody on board to allow the transition to happen. I mean, one of the things, um, and this is not quite about scope three, but it's not utterly unrelated, that is striking to me is that um, in one way, the math physics archive, which is, you know, really used for the vast, vast majority of the papers in some specific fields of physics, um, raises for me real questions about the extent of the value add for the traditional journals that sit behind it. Um, you, you look at it and you say, yeah, but almost all the really significant refereeing and um, uh, discussion and, and use happens very early on, like it, th th that's what the archive enabled. Yet the physicists, um, for their various reasons, have been able to afford to keep the peace by funding and keeping the subscriptions up for those archival journals on the back end of the process. Um, I wonder if, you know, in the face of more severe financial constraints, what choices they would have made. I mean, my, I would at least like to believe that they probably would have um, been willing to throw an awful lot of things under the bus to keep archive alive. And archive is very cheap. Um, if you look at the actual cost of the thing compared to the rest of the publishing apparatus there. I wish I could say something more um, coherent about um, about the scope work. I, I've not followed the negotiations in, in, in great detail. I think they illustrate, you know, how, how genuinely hard it is even in a relatively constrained field with a limited number of publishers to, to make a structural change. And um, certainly it should serve as a cautionary tale to Anyone who wants to wave their hands about, you know, an international coalition to restructure um, scholarly publishing across arbitrary sets of disciplines easily. Um, Erica Linke from Carnegie Mellon. So uh, something you didn't talk about, which but is related to sort of the publishing arm, is what is your th what are your thoughts about how libraries seize? are granted, are gifted, are dumped on, with taking on the means of production, that is, publishing scholarly journals on behalf, or taking on university presses. How do you see this fitting into the changing um, and the, the, the future of the scholarly record or the means of production? Oh, that's a, re that's a really interesting one. Um, let me try to answer that in three or four different ways. So, uh, because there are actually, I think there's some different questions that are threaded together there. 
So one question is about what are fundamentally platforms for scholarly publishing. And um, uh, there are plenty of platforms around. Uh, for example, a very prominent one is the open journal system. Um, and you find many, many libraries now, research libraries, who are running um, instances of that so that their faculty can run publications. And it's kind of murky there. Clearly, the library is putting some technical expertise and institutional you know, consistency behind running the platform. But in most cases that I've seen, the library is not much involved in the intellectual work of running the journal there. Um, that's being carried out by faculty um, in terms of policies, in terms of refereeing and editorial choices and that kind of thing. So they're, they're somewhere between what you think of as a traditional publisher and a platform provider. Um, I suspect that the landscape there is going to change, um, but there are two different forces pulling on it in different ways. In terms of just running a raw platform, um, uh, it's, it's very hard for me to understand why individual institutions need to do that and why it isn't just going to roll to the cloud in the next few years. So just as um, so much of refereeing now um, for conferences is done through things like Easy Chair, and you wouldn't run an instance of that locally. Um, you know, if you want to publish a journal, you just um, uh, register with, um, you know, journals.com or whatever it is and do it. Um, the other pull, though, is that um, if you look at what's involved in running a journal, you know, there's the platform stuff and there's the content stuff. But now there's a whole collection of other odds and ends about getting search engines to index you and getting identifiers and connecting to data repositories and things like that. These things are becoming a significantly larger part of the work that people who publish journals do. And um, somebody is going to need to do that. Um, and th those expertises are not typically the kind of faculty expertises that uh, make up an editorial board in a review cycle. They're, they're really about understanding the mechanics of the um, you know, sort of scholarly distribution system and the stuff you have to do to put content into it. Um, archival relationships with something like Portico or something. Um, and I don't know where those come from. Um, uh, probably from an institutionally based thing um, that's supporting a cloud-based platform, but that's, I, I, I think it's a little bit of early days there. Um, now, another thing to say here is that there is clearly a growing trend of um, changing the reporting structure for um, university presses. Uh, often those used to report to some random person, the um, uh, you know vice provost of finance and business affairs, or you pick it, um, a different at every campus. But now they are often getting attached to libraries. And that's happening with various degrees of intimacy all the way from simply a reporting line, but the press is like a separate corporation that reports up, to you know very tight integration where they're sharing staff positions and, and lots of other things. But uh, and um, uh, the library is providing a lot of the um, technical infrastructure that um, some of the smaller presses could never afford to buy as standalone stuff. I think the overall. Um, impact of that is largely that it's forcing a rethink of institutional um, strategies for disseminating scholarship and the role that the press plays in it. And that's important going both ways. I think that for too many years, too many institutions blew off this question by just saying, oh, we subvene a press for, you know, so much 
of so many dollars a year and they do whatever we're supposed to be doing there. Um, and I think that's, you know, just a totally unsatisfactory answer, um, particularly given the pressures for accountability, for public access to research. You look at state institutions, how they communicate what they do to their funding sources, um, uh, you know, is very critically tied into this. Um, so I think that's a very healthy, um, you know, set of issues that are getting teed up by that um, realignment. Uh, exactly what role the press has come out of that realignment with are very unclear at this point. Um, it may be, for example, that um, people move away from the idea that the press is supposed to be self-sustaining um, and uh, more towards one that you should be subvening a press and the amount of sub subvention is really tied to much more strategic goals by the institution. I should mention that um, CNI, um, ARL, the Association of Research Libraries, and the um, uh, American Association of University Presses have been working together. And we're going to be convening a um, meeting um, in, I think it's, it's either May or June, I'm forgetting the date, of presses that report to the libraries on their campuses. So bringing together the press director and the head of the library to try and better understand what's going on with, with those arrangements. So with that, I think we'll conclude. If you have more questions uh, for our, our guest or for the dean, uh, please feel free to come up after the, um, the session has ended to ask questions. But if you'll please join me in thanking uh, Cliff and Dean Webster for their conversation. Thank you. Good fun.